Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new discussion series on the crime of genocide. My name is Nikos Mikhailidis. I'm a political anthropologist at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. In our first discussion about the crime of genocide against the Greek communities of Pondos or Black Sea and of Anatolia at large, I'm happy to introduce you to our first speaker, Uzay Bulut. Uzay Bulut is a Turkish journalist and a political analyst formerly based in Ankara. As an exiled writer, she has worked and lived in various parts of the world. Her writings have appeared in publications such as Gatestone Institute, Washington Times, Christian Post, Jewish News Syndicate, Al Ahram Weekly, American Spectator, The Providence, and Jerusalem Post. She contributes to the advisory board of the Faces of Persecution, Exploring Global Religious Oppression, which is an educational documentary film series. Bulut's journalistic work focuses mainly on human rights, Turkish politics and history, the plight of Christian and other minorities in the Middle East, and anti-Semitism. She is currently a PhD candidate in international relations. Dear Ruzai, uh, thank you very much for being with me uh, today, and I look forward to listening and to discussing with you. Uzai will present her topic, which will be followed by a discussion. Uzai, thank you very much. Welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, like you said, I'll be talking about Turkey's denial of Pontic Greek genocide and other genocides and how Turkey's official denial, official and aggressive denial, affects its domestic policies and foreign policy. Um, let me, I prepared a presentation, let me... Um, you can share it. Yes, I need to share it. Share screen. Share. Share. Yes. Um, this is the presentation. So I'd like to start by saying that the crime of genocide uh, that Turkey committed between 1914 and 19, sorry, 1913 and 1923 was recognized by the International Association of Genocide Scholars in 2007. And here's a, here is a small paragraph from the resolution they issued in that year. They said, it's the conviction of the International Association of Genocide Scholars that the Ottoman campaign against Christian minorities of the empire between 1914 and 1923 constituted a genocide against Armenians, Assyrians, and Pontian and Anatolian Greeks. The association also called upon the government of Turkey to acknowledge the genocides against these populations to issue a formal apology and to take prompt and meaningful steps toward restitution. So I think it's very, very important to emphasize that this genocide, which is commonly known as the Armenian genocide, actually targeted not only Armenians, but also Greeks, Pontic Greeks, Anatolian Greeks, and Assyrians. It lasted for 10 years from 1913 to uh, 1923, and it happened all across Ottoman Turkey. And this is a historical reality acknowledged by all trustworthy and serious scholars. So uh, there are three books that I'd like to recommend written by um, great uh, historians or genocide scholars. One is Genocide in the Ottoman Empire, Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks. It's edited by George Shirinian, and it came out in 2017. According to, to this book, while this brutal history is most widely known in the case of the Armenian genocide, few today appreciate the extent to which the fate of the empire's Assyrian and Greek subjects was intertwined with that of the Armenians. Another book is uh, about the Assyrian case, Year of the Sword, the Assyrian Christian Genocide, a history written by Professor Joseph Yakub. And according to, this, according to his research, systematic killings, looting, rape, kidnapping, and deportations destroyed countless communities and created a vast refugee diaspora, as many as 300 thousand Assyrio, Chaldean, Syriac people were murdered and a larger number forced into exile. And another book, the last one that I'll recommend is about the Greek genocide, the genocide of the Ottoman Greeks. 
studies on the state-sponsored campaign of extermination of the Christians of Asia Minor in its aftermath, History of Law Memory, edited by Tessa Hoffman, Matthias Bjornland, and Basilios Mekanetsidis. This volume, this book, represents an effort to provide an outline and a direction of a more extensive study of the deliberate destruction and elimination of a Greek presence that spanned over three millennia in the space that became the Turkish Republic. So there are many books that have been published about the Christian genocide that Turkey committed. And my presentation will specifically focus on the Pontian case, the Pontian Greek uh, genocide, because I was born in that region. I come from that region, so I'm familiar with the culture and society of that region. But uh, what needs to be understood, and I think the most important reality of this discussion is the genocide lasted for 10 years, and it targeted defenseless subjects of the Ottoman Empire, the Christians basically, and some Yazidi communities as well. And Turkey still, so there's actually no debate to be had over this, but the debate that we must have is about Turkey's denial, the methods Turkey uses to deny the genocide and how aggressive and how hostile it is and what kind of consequences this denial creates for both the people of Turkey and the wider region. So uh, genocide denied is genocide continued, actually. The genocide of Greeks by Turkey continues today through, I would say, two methods. One is the systematic denial of the genocide, and the other is the Turkish attempts to completely erase the millennia-old Greek civilization in Pontos and Anatolia, also known as cultural heritage destruction. Uh, genocide scholar Dr. Gregory Stanton says that denial is the last stage of genocide and there are eight stages of genocide, classification, symbolization, dehumanization, organization, polarization, preparation, and denial. Denial is actually the continuation of ge the genocide because it's a continuing attempt to destroy the victim group psychologically and culturally, to deny its members even the memory of the murders of their relatives. In Turkey, has been doing it for the last 100 years in an aggressive way and trying to silence those who speak about the genocide and also on international platforms, applying a lot of pressure on Greek governments to make them deny the genocide. Turkey has spent so many resources uh, to, to force, force foreign governments uh, to, to continue um, to continue to deny this genocide for decades. I mean, when you think about what Turkey could have achieved with the same resources in Turkey, instead of trying to deny this genocide, it, it's really unbelievable. I mean, spending all that, all those resources, financial and otherwise, on the denial of genocide. But, you know, there are reasons for that, and we will be discussing those reasons soon. So what kind of rhetoric, denialist rhetoric, Turkey is using? Uh, inside, I mean, both in Turkey and outside. And I would say that there are different rhetorics, different narratives tur that Turkey uses to address when it addresses its own population and when it addresses foreigners or international observers. But there's one fact that hasn't changed for the past 100 years. The Turkish government has for de decades denied that the Greek genocide ever occurred government officials even condemn Greek officials when they mention the genocide or erect a monument to commemorate it. For example, let me give you a very recent example. On the 19th of May, 2022, when the Greek Ministry of Foreign Affairs issued a statement uh, commemorating the victims of the Pontian Greek genocide, Turkey's Ministry of Foreign Affairs issued his, its own statement condemning, condemning Greece and condemning the descendants of the genocide survivors. I will read uh, an English translation. We totally reject the delusional statements that were made by the Greek authorities on the pretext of the anniversary of the baseless Pontus claims, which aim at completely distorting history. It's sad to see that the Greek authorities continue to irrationally distort history. We also condemn the efforts of those anti-Turkey lobbyists who deceive the public by bringing these distorted claims to the agenda in third countries. It's clear that these efforts led by those who try to draw hostility from history 
and mislead young generations will not serve peace and stability, goes in and on, but less sentences. We invite Greece to work together for peace, stability, and a prosperous future based on cooperation instead of distorting the facts. So according to Turkey, if Greece wants to make peace with the Turkish state, Greece and Greek people, both inside Turkey and in the diaspora, should stop talking about what happened to their ancestors in Anatolia and in Pontus. Otherwise, what Greece gets or what Greek people get is those hostile and threatening messages from Turkey. I just would like you to think about how the world or the international community would react if Germany made a similar statement about the Holocaust addressing Jewish people or Israel. I mean, I think when we make this analogy, Turkey's reaction to the Greek commemoration of the Pontian Greek genocide, um, I mean, it looks really unbelievable. Every sentence in that statement is a scandal, actually, especially when we think, I mean, here there's a perpetrator and there's a victim group, and this is how the perpetrator reacts to the victim group even after 100 years later. And another reality I'd like to discuss is how the Pontian Greek genocide is portrayed or described in the official narratives in Turkey. This is from the Minister of Culture and Tourism. And it's about Rize. Rize is a city in Pontos on the Black Sea shore in Northern Turkey. So this is how they describe what happened during the genocide. After the Russians withdrew, armed Greek gangs began to emerge, Greek gangs. Efforts were being made to establish a Pont Greek Pontic state in the region against these developments. The Trabzon Association for Defense of National Rights was established in Trabzon, which included the entire Eastern Blacks region. The Rize branch of this association was opened on December, on the 8th of December, 1922, with the arrival of the Eastern Front commander, Kazım Karabekir Pasha in Rize. The fight against the Greek gangs was planned. So there's one thing here, at least they, they acknowledged the fact that whatever they would do to the Greeks was pre-planned, it was planned. But of course, they refer to their targets as Greek gangs, because that's the official narrative in Turkey. The, of course, they don't call them victims, but those people were targeted, or Turks had to deal with those people because they were gangs, they were criminals, they were murderers, rapists, rapists, they were breaking the law, they were troublemakers, so Turkey had to deal with them. Turkey had to relocate them and stop them. This is the official narrative. So there's still, you know, the, the victim is the perpetrator, the perpetrator is the victim, black is white, white is black, everything is upside down, according to this um, narrative. And I also would like to talk about this. Um, there's a wonderful article written by Professor Roger Smith, and it's about genocide denial. It talks about how certain governments and individuals you um, deny genocides, and he also talks about the Armenian case. But whatever he says about the Armenian case, we can also make the same arguments about the Pontic Greek case. And he says, the claim, I mean, the claim of the denialist governments was that the events did not take place, or for example, there were not in any case that many deaths, oh, I can't see, can I move, okay. Inflicted upon the Armenians, they just died, but what they did to us, however, was brutal and deliberate. That we bear no responsibility for what happened. It was disease, breakdown of authority, self-defense, civil war. Those are Turkey's excuses for what they did to the victims, hundreds of thousands of people. And that the term genocide is not applicable, applicable to the events. Acts were in self-defense by overzealous officials and insisted above all, without intent to eliminate a group in whole or substantial part. And this part is important as well. There are three main elements of denial. The facts, the responsibility, and the applicability of the crime of genocide to whatever happened. Lately, a new theme offering yet another logical possibility in the denial of genocide has gained traction, trivialization and relativization. This creates many new opportunities for denial arguments. There could be a moral equivalence argument, both sides engaged in a genocide. Hence, it's concluded there were no victims or perpetrators. 
Universalizing the guilt means that no one was guilty. The Turkish government really engages in all these narratives, trivial, trivial, trivialization, relativization, blaming both sides, saying there was a war, you know, there, they committed crimes, they started it, we acted in self-defense using all kinds of excuses and false claims to blame the victims for what happened to them, for all the crimes, and including the crime of genocide that was committed against them. But there is one more thing that Turkey does. Turkey really takes this denial to a whole different level, which is celebration and glorification of genocide. And this includes all victims, the Armenian genocide, Pontic genocide. So the denialism mentality in Turkey portrays the genocide victims as genocide perpetrators. They were plunderers, I mean the victims. They were plunderers, murderers, rapists, and unlawful gang members. The perpetrators of, of genocide, the Turks, however, were the real victims who just tried to defend themselves. I would like to give you an example. First of all, every year in every town and city in Turkey, we celebrate uh, the liberation of that town and city from you know, occupiers or criminals. Who are those occupiers? It's either the French, the British, Russians, and local Greeks and local Armenians and local Assyrians. For example, th there's one uh, celebration at a public event in Rize, again in Pontos, in Chayali, a town in Rize. And according to this, I, I would like to show you a clip if I could. Russian invaders, according to this celebration, as well as Armenian and Greek local traders. Um, so the city was liberated from these groups. So imagine you are liberating a city from the indigenous peoples of the city. According to this stage play performed by school children and other locals, um, you know, the, the liberation took place targeting the Greek and Armenian gangs or criminals and it also included the use of blank cartridge guns and wooden rifles and the killings of Christians in the city who were portrayed as criminals. So according to the newsp uh, newspaper Hurriyet, this is how it happened. Following the Russian invasion, the Greek and Armenian gangs mistreated Turkish citizens. The gang members were made, uh, sorry, made Turkish men lie on the ground, stepped on them and used violence against women saying Turks are cowards shooting their blank cartridge guns, the Turkish militia of forces entered the area, saved the Turkish captives and killed the Armenian gang members who were resisting. So this is, this is a stage play in the center, in the square of a, of a town, the whole political and military establishment of the town joined these join this stage play, I mean, as the audience, they are watching it. And there are also locals, you know, there is a huge audience. They're all watching this stage play. And this is how they think the genocide happened. There were criminal Greeks and Armenians and the brave victorious Turks had to deal with them because they were criminals. This is, I mean, there's a video of it. Maybe if we have time at the end, I will show it to you. It's really, I mean, it, it, it is something you need to see this. In academia also, Turkish academics have meticulously neglected to study but so, uh, this issue, but some articles by Turkish researchers have attempted to refute what they call the claims of the Greek or Pontic Greek genocide. These academics perpetually refer to the genocide as, you know, this is a classic in Turkey, the so-called genocide, the genocide lie, that's how they refer to it. And in the media, the media also is in complete denial, but there are two scenarios when coverage is certain, when Greece erects a commemorative mon monument for the genocide and when a Western government or institution recognizes or discusses the genocide or erects monuments in recognition of it. In all such coverage in both the mainstream and local Turkish media, the news reports or columns accuse Greece or other Western states of plotting against Turkey through its efforts of spreading lies and propaganda about the so-called Greek or Pontian Greek genocide. I'd like to give you an example. This is from the 7th of October, 2027. It's a major newspaper in Turkey, Yeni Shafak. And you, you can see there's a, so here's a title. Greece is being provocative again. They erected the so-called Pontic genocide monument in Istanbul. Istanbul is the 
Coast Island. And the first paragraph says, a new provocation was launched on the Greek island of Istanbul coast. The so-called Pontic Hellenism genocide monument was erected on the island just across boardroom up here large. Speaking at the ceremony, a Greek official implied that they expect an apology from Turkey. So here you can see the monument that was erected and the opening ceremony. And this is how the Turkish media, and there's no difference between pro-government and the anti-government media when it comes to the coverage of the Greek genocide or Pontic Greek genocide, this is how it's covered. When you talk about the reality of the genocide here, to honor your ancestors, to, to remember their memories, and to you know, attempt to obtain some justice for the crime of genocide, unfortunately, the media in Turkey sees it as provocation. You know, they are provo provoking you to do what? I mean, it's really, again, this is, this is the hostile terminology used by the Turkish media. When, when there is a public debate about the genocide here in, in Greece. So um, there's also denial of educational institutions. And that was the case when I was in Turkey too. Like, you know, when I was in middle school um, and high school, there was actually in the books, of course, the genocide or, you know, the Greek history, the Greek roots of Pontos or the Black Sea region, Trabzon, Rize, Art. of course, we don't, we are not taught these things. But the only time I remember the books, the textbooks talked about the genocide was during the Turkish War of Liberation, um, those minorities, Greeks and Armenians, they established harmful organizations to divide and destroy Ottoman, you know, Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. And, you know, they, they got, they received support from the allied powers and they aim to establish independent states of their own Anatolia. So while Turks were fighting for, you know, independence and freedom against the imperialists, minorities were busy betraying Turks. They were busy breaking the law. They were busy targeting not only Turks, but also their fellow Armenians and Greeks. So Turks had to take action. This was the only thing we were taught, but today, I know that the narrative, the denialist narrative is even more aggressive. Right now, the Armenians and Greeks are openly and directly uh, accused of, for the genocide, accused of what happened to them. And Professor Taner Akşam wrote a very good article about it, um, analyzing the textbooks, the history textbooks in Turkey. So today, the denial is even more severe and more hostile. So when I was in Turkey, when I was in high school, it was just, oh, you know, there were some harmful organizations and we had to stop them. But today, the books give a lot more details about how treacherous, how hostile Greeks and Armenians were. And that's why, um, you know, the Turkish people had to take action against them. And again, what makes the denial, denialist mentality in Turkey I would say unique, very unique, is the glorification of the genocide. It's not just denial. When we say, we say denial, yes, there's denial, but there's also um, some pride in it, a very strong element of pride in it. And you see it in the government, you know, when the government officials talk about it, for example, President Erdogan, I think it was two years ago, he referred to the Armenian genocide as the most reasonable decision at the time. We had to relocate them. And that was the most reasonable, reasonable decision of time. That's how he referred to it. So there's this glorification of the genocide in Turkey. And I would say there are three narratives. I would go through them very fast. The first one is we did not slaughter them. They slaughtered us. And I just talked about it according to this narrative, Armenians, Greeks, and Assyrians, they were not victims of Turkish persecution. Instead, they were the aggressors. So they were, you know, they cooperated with the imperialists to divide and destroy Turkey. So the oppressed Turks had to take action. Another narrative is even more um, crazy uh, because this narrative directly um, not only accuses the victims, but it says that we could do it again. They deserved it and we could do it again. Yes, we did slaughter them. And if they do not behave, we will slaughter them again. And especially on social media, you can see a lot of Turkish nationalists 
sending pictures of life jackets to Greeks, for example, referring to the Simona fire, Simona genocide, telling them, hmm, you might need this life jacket this time, or next time, learn to swim better, because they know that Greeks were, you know, they got drowned in the Aegean Sea, that's how they, they, they were murdered, so they not only, they don't actually deny it, they are proud of it, and they say, we could do it again, so that, that's another narrative that is commonly and openly expressed across Turkey. There's a third one, which I would say is used for international observers. And you can see that language in many uh, statements issued by Turkey's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and it's, it's more moderate. It says that, you know, a tragedy happened during World War I. They slaughtered, they slaughtered us and we slaughtered them. It was a war. Let's move on. Let's forget it. But again, this is denial too. And this is this is victim blaming too, but this is not as radical and as inhumane as the first two, because this is for the outside world, particularly the West. So there's also a lot of legal pressure uh, targeting people in Turkey who would like to talk about these issues. So when we talk about these things, you know, we might get prosecuted. If you're in Turkey, you could get arrested. You could be dismissed from your job. You could be killed, you know, for saying these things, for, for having this public debate. And because there are laws in Turkey, for example, there's one law, Article 301 of the Tur Turkish Criminal Code. It makes it illegal to insult Turkey, the Turkish nation, or Turkish government institutions. And there are also several terrorism laws used by prosecutors to bring to account those who have dissident views by accusing them of terrorism-related charges. So for even, even members of the parliament, particularly Kurdish members of parliament, and one, one Armenian, Garo Paylan, he was also, uh, an investigation was launched against him for violating Article 301. And Paylan's office said that the investigation was launched after comments he made in an interview about genocides taking place in Turkey today. So there's this legal pressure, but it's not just legal pressure. Like I said, you could lose your job, you could be physically targeted, you could be attacked, you could be killed. And when you lose your job, you're blacklisted, it's, it becomes almost impossible for you to find a job. So they are punishing you with starvation. You know, there are a lot of risks of talking about these things in Turkey, even in your outside, even if you're outside of Turkey. So, Lastly, um, I'd like to talk about the cultural heritage destruction in Pontus because this is one of the methods that Turkey uses to um, erase, erase the once Greek presence in Pontus and in Anatolia. Uh, Greek churches, particularly churches, not only churches, but also you know, schools, other buildings that used to be belong to Greeks. They are targeted, they are abused, they are seized and used as Turkish buildings. Now, if they are churches, those beautiful historic churches are turned into mosques, stables, museums, and other facilities. A recent victim is the historic Greek church in the city of Trabzon. You know, it was built as a church. And there are, when we talk about Hagia Sophia, most of us only think of the church in Istanbul, Constantinople, but there's there are at least nine Hagia Sophias across Turkey, and they are either mosques now or they are in the process of being converted into mosques. So this is one of them in Trabzon. It's also very well known and very beautiful. It was the church first then the Ottomans converted into a mosque. Then in 1964, it became a museum. And now in 2013, it was turned into a mosque again. And here, according to the local media, here, how it has been converted into a mosque. I mean, it's been damaged severely. And I'll read a few translations here. Christian symbols in the church have been damaged or destroyed. Nails have been pounded into the walls in order to hang curtains inside the new mosque to create a separate section for women. The frescoes on the ceiling have been veiled with wooden curtains and the mosaics on the floors have been covered with a carpet. Some walls have been painted green. There's a video, again, if we have time at the end, I might show it to you. 
But it, those are all well documented. So when they convert a church, a historic church into a mosque, it's actually destruction. It, it doesn't become a new place of worship. You are destroying the religious and cultural heritage of genocide victims or of the indigenous peoples of those lands when, when you, you know, commit such crimes against cultural heritage to disrupt cultural heritage of those peoples. So another example I'd like to give, which is very, I think, interesting, and there was a report about it in the Turkish press recently. And here is the title of the report. It said, the mansion where Ataturk, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk wrote out his will is being restored in preparation for the centenary of the Turkish Republic. So this report was um, issued on the 29th of October, but this mansion in the city of Trabzon was actually built by a Greek businessman, Konstantinos Kapagianidis. Kapanian, Kapagianidis used the residence as his summer retreat. He built it in 1890. Ataturk visited Trabzon three times in 1931, the Turkish government gave him the house. Today it's called Ataturk's Mansion. It's a beautiful, gorgeous building and is used as a museum. So the building used to be the Kapagianidis residence. Turkey, however, prefers to dismiss the building's true origins and how it became Turkish property and what happened to the indigenous Greeks of Pontos from 1919 to 1923. So this building has become one of the symbols of Trabzon, and it's known as Ataturk Mansion, but actually it was built and owned by a Greek man. And then it was, how, how did Turks get this building? Was it seized? Did they buy it? I mean, it, most, it was most likely illegally seized. And what happened to the owner? What happened to the person who built it? And why aren't we taught about the true history of the building. Is it really Ataturk's mansion? Who built it, Turks or Greeks? I mean, everything in that region, unfortunately, is about the denial of the genocide and the erasure of the Greek presence there. Another example, there's uh, another building, a Greek school, Prontisterion of Trapezos. This is, this is the original name of the school. It's now Kanuni Anatolian High School. So this school, Trapezos College, was a Greek educational institution that operated from 1682 to 1921 in Trabzon. The school was founded by Sevastos Kiminitis, a forerunner of the modern Greek Enlightenment, and became the most influential center of Greek education in Pontos. The school closed in November 1921. Today, the building houses a Turkish school, the Kanoni Anatolian High School, named after the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman, the lawgiver. I graduated from this high school. And when I was there, of course, I had no idea that the building used to be a Greek school. I always thought, just like other, you know, my friends, classmates, this is a Turkish building. It was built by Turks, it's ours. But no, it used to be a Greek building, a Greek school, and one of the most important schools of Pontus, actually. But it was, you know, after the genocide, when and the forcible population exchange between Turkey and Greece, the local Greeks were exterminated. They were forced to leave. They were deported. So there were no Greek students left, no Greek teachers left, and this school became Turkish property. So the problem is, Turks not only have unjustly and illegally seized all those buildings, Greek and Armenian buildings, we also um, deny or ignore or erase the true history behind those buildings. And I think this is part of the government's systematic attempts of eliminating or completely erasing the history, the history, the true history of the region. And this is the school. This is an old postcard, and this is its current state. This is the Kanoni Anatolian High School. So I'd like to give one example about the scope of property confiscations. You know, the Greek presence in Pontos ended with the genocide and with the forcible population exchange, but the Greek presence in Constantinople continued. And, and there is still a very, very, very small Greek population in Constantinople, but 
even after the genocide, there was a sizable Greek community in Constantinople. And please pay attention to the data, the statistics here. I think it's unbelievable. In 90, when we compare it with the current situation of Constantinople and Beolo, in 1922, the National Turkish Trade Association was founded to determine which businesses were Turkish. The association discovered that 97% of the import export trade in Istanbul and all shops, stores, restaurants and entertainment centers in Beyoğlu were owned by minorities. This survey was a precursor to actions taken with the aim of Turkifying the city's economy. So think about it. Think about Beyoğlu, I don't know if you've been there, Taksim. You know, there are a lot of stores, restaurants, businesses, offices there, entertainment centers. 97% of them used to belong to Greeks, Armenians, or Jews in 1922. Today, almost all of it belongs to Turks. How did this happen, right? How did... So the genocide actually didn't end in 1923. It continued with these, you know, seizures of properties and other, other uh, undemocratic methods. So also another issue that I'd like to talk about is the non-existent Greek cemeteries in Pontos. This is a link. I don't know if I can go to the internet and copy and paste it. I don't want to because I'm scared. I might not be able to return. So I'm just going to talk about it. But when I Google Greek cemeteries in Pontos, in the Black Sea region, and I write specific names of the cities there, there is nothing. And I asked local researchers, local journalists, have you ever seen a Greek cemetery in Trabzon, in Pontos? When I was there, I didn't see anything. So I asked people who might know, and they said, no, we haven't seen anything. So if Greeks had lived there for millennia, one would expect that there would be, there should be some cemeteries. So where are the cemeteries? Where are the graves, the bones of you know dead Greeks? There's nothing left. So this is a question that we need to ask publicly. Where are the Greek cemeteries in Pontos? Okay, the people have been killed, okay. Their cultural heritage is still being targeted and abused, but at least respect the dead, right? Respect the cemeteries. So the destruction, I'm using this word intentionally, the destruction of the Greek cemeteries in the region, it just shows that the government of Turkey aims at erasing every single sign of the Greek presence and the Armenian presence in the region, just they aim at complete erasure, complete elimination. Otherwise, they would have respected the cemeteries and at least there would be some graves there, but there is nothing. And lastly, I'd like to talk about the governor of Trabzon between, uh, I mean, during the World War I, his name's Jamal Azmi, and he was the governor of Trabzon during the final years of the Ottoman Empire. He was one of the perpetrators of the Armenian genocide. And he was known as the butcher of Trabzon. He was especially known for his persecution and violence towards Armenian children. He ordered the drowning of thousands of women and children in the Black Sea. But here is how he is being honored honored in Turkey. There is a primary school in a village in Trabzon named after him a primary school, Jamal Azmi Bay Primary School. So, and this is not the only example. The government of Turkey still honors the memories of genocide perpetrators. Many roads, streets, schools, and other venues across Turkey are named after genocide perpetrators. And here's the school, Jamal Azmi Bay Primary School. It's, it's, it's in Trabzon. Um, I'm not ending, but I'd like to end. Um, my presentation with a question asked by Dr. Alfred de Zayas. He is an expert on international law. And he, he wrote an article about the pogrom against the Greek minority of Constantinople in 1955. And he's asking this question, but I think we should ask this question, not only for the pogrom, but also for the Pontic Greek genocide and the Greek genocide. The awkwardness of the prevailing situation can be demonstrated by a hypothetical example. How would the international community have reacted if the post-war German government had named streets after Joseph Goebbels and Reinhard Heydrich, the architects of Kristallnacht? 
what would the reaction of the international community have been if instead of making moral and material reparation, the German government had refused to render restitution and compensation to the victims and their survivors? Yeah, I think that's it's a very important question that we need to ask. And every time we see the glorification of, Tur of the genocide in Turkey, we should ask how would the world react if any other government guilty of genocide did this, any other government? in the West or in the East, doesn't matter. And how uh, all of this denial and celebration of genocide affects Turkey's foreign policy. I'd like to talk about this a little bit. We know what's going on in Turkey. We know that everyone that the government perceives to be its enemy or its opponent is targeted. There are tens of thousands of political prisoners in Turkey, particularly Kurds. You know, there, there's an ongoing lawsuit against the legal Kurdish party in the parliament and Kurdish journalists and other dissenting journalists are arrested almost every week. We know about all of these things. And I think the impunity that Turkey has been enjoying for decades, despite the crime of genocide it committed for 10 years during its founding phase, I think that's the basic reason, the most fundamental reason why Turkey is violating the human rights of its own citizens so severely and in such a widespread and systematic manner. And about the foreign policy, we look at Turkey's aggression against Iraq, Syria, even against the Yazidi survivors of the ISIS genocide, you know, 19, no, 2014 genocide. Yazidis have been the victims of air raids carried out by Turkey. So there's a community in Iraq, Yazidis, they're already persecuted. They already became victims of a horrible genocide at the ends of, at the ends of ISIS. Their homeland, Sinjar, has been largely destroyed. Many of them still live in forcibly displaced camps in Iraq. They want to return to Sinjar, but they are scared because of Turkey's airstrikes. And Yazidis, Kurds, and Assyrians in Iraq and Syria are all being seriously affected by Turkey's military actions in Iraq and Syria. And these are all well documented in international um, news outlets. Turkey and ISIS, again, Turkey is known to, unfortunately, that's a, that's a really shameful thing for, for citizens of Turkey, for us. ISIS terrorists are living and operating in Turkey, some with Yazidi, Yazidis abducted from Syria or Iraq. And here I'm referencing, I'm quoting Professor Mortejai Kedar. He has documented Turkey's relations with ISIS, Turkey's strong connections, sorry, ISIS's strong connections to Turkey uh, in its oil industry and other sectors. You know, ISIS terrorists used Turkish territory to go to Iraq and Syria for years. And why? You can say, how is that related to Turkey's denial of the genocide? Well, I think the answer is, if you can justify, if you can glorify a crime of genocide that led to the deaths of around 3 million people for 10 years, I think you can justify anything. You can do anything because your republic, your state, um, I'm being brutally honest here, maybe I'll be in trouble, but if you established a republic based on the crime of genocide, and if you still take pride in it, of course, there's no limit to the other crimes that you will commit. And I think that's what, what's going on in Turkey. And Turkey is also exploiting and co-opting parts of Syria alongside the jihadist Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, it's a jihadist group, and Al-Qaeda affiliate, affiliate. And there's a study by the Middle East Institute. They say the Turkish government through its massive economic support to the group thereby became a lifeline for the jihadist Hayat Tahrir al-Sham in Syria. Other examples for Turkey's aggressive foreign policy as you know, it has been covered by the international media. Also Israeli diplomats have talked about it. H Hamas offices and companies are operating in Turkey. Turkey has granted citizenship to high ranking Hamas members living in the country. And also there is also uh, the Turkish Azeri ongoing, ongoing aggressive war against Armenians. And this war has been ongoing for the past two years. 
and it has caused an ethnic cleansing and a forcible displacement of tens of thousands of Armenians. And also, and we need, I think, another debate about this, Turkey's ongoing illegal occupation of the northern part of the Republic of Cyprus. Oh, finally, it's over. So all of these things, all of this aggression of the government of Turkey, both inside its borders and outside, I mean, we should, I think, draw parallels between Turkey's denial of the genocide, Turkey's glorification of the genocide, and Turkey's ongoing and very severe crimes against its own citizens. So many people have had to leave, leave Turkey, and so many people have been dismissed from their jobs for arbitrary trumped up charges. And so many people, there are, like I said, thousands, tens of thousands of political prisoners in Turkish jails. All of this, um, how does Turkey find, when I say Turkey, I mean the government, the military, the state institutions, how do they find um, the courage to commit all these crimes on a daily basis? Because they have been enjoying impunity. They've never been brought to account and they have been, they have got rid of their Christian and Jewish citizens through many crimes, including a genocide, including many pogroms, including forced deportations and pressure, 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 targeting both Jews and Christians and Yazidis also. And today, because there are no non-Muslims to persecute, they are targeting their Muslim citizens. They're targeting, they've been targeting Kurds for decades actually, but they're also targeting, uh, you know, other, other ethnic Turks in Turkey for whatever reason, because they need, you know, they need some enemy to, to target. That's, that's how they, I think, how they nurture, you know, their traditions. Because really, when, you, when you, for example, a few days ago, when Kurdish journalists were arrested, nine Tur uh, Kurdish journalists, the police also seized their computers. Again, that's a Turkish state tradition. You get rid of the minority citizens and then you seize their properties illegally. So this tradition, targeting citizens violently. And first, their goal was to create a Muslim-dominated, a Turkish-dominated republic. And then when they achieved this goal and when no one brought them to account, when they were never held accountable, when they were never held responsible, they are now committing all kinds of atrocities, both against their own citizens and against the whole region, actually. Unfortunately, Turkey has become a source of instability for the whole region. So if you wanna understand Turkey, that's why I always try to write about the genocide in my articles. We cannot understand Turkey's current affairs without understanding Turkey's genocide against Christians, Pontic Greeks, Armenians, Assyrians, and Turkey's official and aggressive denial of the genocide. Those things, so Turkey's denial or Turkey's genocide is not a thing of the past. It's about Turkey's present. It's about Turkey's future. So this is why having such conversations, public conversations is very important. And thank you for having me. Yeah. Dear Ruzai, thank you very, very much for this very informative presentation. And I really appreciate the very important connections uh, you are drawing between, on the one hand, a, a crime that was committed against the Greek of Pondos and of Anatolia at large about 100 years ago, and how that crime and the impunity that successive Turkish governments have gained in a 100-year period, how this impunity shapes contemporary political culture and uh, Turkish foreign policy, expansionism, and aggressiveness. And I would like to go back to these issues. We, uh, we have a few more minutes for, uh, for a short discussion. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you if you would like to, uh, uh, to comment. Of course, it is shocking to realize as researchers, as analysts, uh, to realize that Turkey is maybe the only ex-colonial uh, state that not only recognizes the crimes, the genocides, uh, committed against Greeks and other communities, indigenous communities of Anatolia and Pondos. But uh, it is also trying to completely distort historical uh, facts. I don't know of any other ex-colonial country uh, in Europe or anywhere else that is doing uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, distortion. It's really, really shocking and we need to address this 
publicly, we need to analyze and discuss it uh, further. So I wanted to um, ask you to uh, tell us a few more things about uh, you know, the, the kind of impact that this distortion, this denial of historical facts, but also the distortion of historical facts, the impact that it has on um, uh, modern Turkey's national identity and uh, worldview. Mm -hmm. How does it impact contemporary citizens, the way they view themselves as modern Turks, as citizens of a, of a state? and what kind of a worldview and what kind of a political culture this distortion creates. Because we know very well in anthropology, in sociology and in other fields, when we study political culture, we know very well that the way citizens understand and perceive the past shapes their political culture and beliefs in the present. So talking about history or changing our ideas, our knowledge about the past, is crucial if we want to change and democratize the political uh, culture. So this denial and distortion of the historical facts of genocide against Pontic Greeks and other Greeks in Anatolia, what kind of impact, ideological and cultural impact does it have on, on Turkish uh, citizens today? Well, I think it changes their whole identity or, or, or it creates an identity that sees themselves, the Turkish students, as victims. But um, I can say that the people in Turkey, an average Turk, lives in a parallel universe. Because when we talk about the genocide, when we talk about Turkish history, I know from personal experience, the most people in Turkey have no idea about the truth of genocide. They think that, you know, I just mentioned what they are taught, what we are taught at schools. We were targeted. We were actually, we were about to be victims of genocide but we acted in self-defense. And now all these hostile governments are accusing us of genocide. We didn't do anything. So, you know, everything in Turkey, in the educational system, in the media, just promotes this very unhealthy, hostile, aggressive, and expansionist nationalism, pan-Turkish nationalism. And that's why they don't have a democratic political culture and, because, I mean, you, you have a country, you have a republic, and it was established on the blood and stolen property of millions of people. And you have no idea about this. You actually think that you are the victim of this crime and you are now falsely accused of genocide, but you're actually innocent. So this, I, I'm not, this is not an overstatement. Turks in Turkey, the vast majority of the population is actually living in their own parallel universe completely detached from reality. And it's really heartbreaking, you know, to see that. And that's why they can justify their aggression against Iraq. They can justify their aggression against Kurds, Syria, because in their mind, in their Turkish supremacist mind, all of these actions are easily justifiable. So the denial of the genocide is again, I think you made a very important point. It creates a certain identity and it creates a worldview, a supremacist, racist and aggressive worldview. Like, why don't they accept official equality between Turks and Kurds, right? There are two major communities, ethnic communities in Turkey now. Recognize the Kurdish autonomy, recognize, no. Because of this, you know, supremacist mindset, I think we need, like I said, and maybe another debate about this, that sees themselves as not only victims, but also conquerors and victors and, you know, this completely righteous nation. So they can do anything. And if they commit a crime, it's not a crime, but this, you know, this whole distortion of history actually distorts their thinking really, prevents them from thinking as healthy individuals, I would say. No, thank you very much. This is a very interesting point. And this is something that is not uh, really discussed in international fora when we think and we talk about uh, Turkey. There is a kind of standardized discourse that addresses Turkey's uh, um, regime problems, the lack of democracy, human rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But usually many commentators and analysts fail to go to the heart of this political culture that recreates and reproduces and legitimizes uh, an autocratic, aggressive political regime that creates a lot of instability. And I dare to say 
Uh, it has come to the point of constituting a serious security threat uh, for the Eastern Mediterranean and the, uh, and the Middle East. And all these contemporary issues connect uh, with what happened a hundred years ago and the political culture of impunity that was shaped um, since then. Absolutely. So my next- Can I give uh, one, one last example? I met a yes, person yes, and she told me she has been to Turkey seven times and it was a good experience and she is Greek. And I asked her, you know, did you experience any problems? She said, no, it was fine because as long as you don't talk about politics, you're yes. safe. So the question is, why can't you talk about politics with Turks? If it's a healthy, free, democratic society, you should be able to have, you know, a conversation with them, a political conversation. No, she avoided talking about politics to stay safe. And I think this speaks volumes about the culture there, the political culture. If you want to stay safe, don't talk about politics, don't say things that they might disagree with. So again, you've mentioned an identity, you know, the lack of, it's about the lack of free speech, not respecting people who think differently, not respecting, uh, you know, different openings. And if you don't have that, a society can't progress. You can't become a democracy. You can't become, you know, a civilized country if you don't have free speech. And we don't have that in Turkey because anyone who, who brings up these issues based on facts, historical facts, you know, they are violently silenced. And my friend knew that she had to keep her mouth shut to stay safe in Turkey. So yeah. I wanted to mention Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the other, the other thing that I would like to bring up is the issue of democratization, because we uh, very well know how political culture connects to the political regime in Turkey, in the creation of this autocratic uh, regime. Um, and also uh, the issue of democratization and also the anti-Western sentiment that is very, very widespread in contemporary Turkey. And as I said earlier, many Western, um, or at least some Western uh, democracies and the European Union and the United States of America have criticized uh, Turkey uh, for it's a human rights, a bad human rights record and the lack of uh, democracy, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we need to go deeper. We need to think and talk about the political culture, in the dominant political culture and how we can help the people of Turkey to change that political culture and create a democracy in their country, a, a Western style democracy, a liberal democracy and we need definitely need to address the issue of genocide. We need to help them uh, reevaluate uh, the past and uh, teach the younger generations what actually happened in the past. And that's, I think, the only way uh, forward for Turkey and for its people who really want to live in the future, hopefully in a democratic society that will also uh, have uh, stable cooperative relationships with all its neighbors and with the Western uh, world at large. So what would you, uh, how would you comment on that? Uh, what would you expect from the European Union or from activists and scholars uh, or politicians from other countries, from the Western world and the democratic world uh, regarding the issue of genocide? What should we do in order to help Turkey overcome uh, this highly problematic uh, situation? when it comes to the genocide and its connection to the democratization of the country. How can other democratic, the democratic partners of Turkey can help this country uh, regarding this issue? Thank you for this question. I think it's a very important question because you said that how can we help the people of Turkey? I think it's very important for Turks, at least for the open-minded Turks, to understand that when we criticize Turkey, when we talk about its bloody history, we're not being, we're not doing it to be hostile. We're not doing it because we hate Turkey. We're doing it because we love the truth and we want justice for the victims. And we want Turkey to be a democracy. We want Turkey to respect its own citizens and to stop threatening its neighbors, to stop occupying its neighbors. So it's not about hostility. It's not about racism. It's actually about- It's the opposite. The opposite. It's about love for truth and love for justice. And of course, we want the peoples in the region to, to be safe. 
and we don't want them to be commit to be exposed to crimes at the hands of Turkey. That's why we are criticizing Turkey. So yes, th the whole aim of this conversation and everything that we are trying to do is to help the people of Turkey. And about first of all, about the anti-West sentiment in Turkey. When I was there, like when I was in primary school, middle, high school, we were never, you know, the West was never portrayed as an ally. Like I don't remember anything in our textbooks or in the you know class discussions in which we said that, oh, the West is our, no. What we're told, and this is our psyche, the Turkish psyche, the West, okay, we need them maybe, but they're our enemy. They are hostile to us. They, they are hostile to us. The only friend a Turk has is other Turks, like we are our own friends, nobody, maybe Azerbaijan, <laughs> but nobody else is our friend, especially the West. I mean, when you look at the Turkish national anthem, they refer to uh, the Western civilization as the monster, the national, the national anthem of Turkey. So, I mean, even before Erdogan came to power, the West was not portrayed as a friend of Turkey by the media, by the government, by our educational system. No, this was this has never been the case. So I agree with you that you know the anti-Western sentiment in Turkey is very strong. And unfortunately, the West majority of Turkey don't see the West as their partner or ally. That's my observation. Yeah. And second of all, what could the West do to help democratize Turkey? I don't think they've been paying enough attention to the official recognition of the Armenian genocide, the Pontic Greek genocide and the Greek genocide, the whole genocide issue. Because you can, democracy can never be founded on false foundations. You cannot pretend to you know, build a civilized country, a democracy or the rule of law after you know, on, on a crime of genocide. And I think Turkey's aggression today against it, particularly against its own citizens, is because there are some lies that they've been telling for decades, and there are some truths that they've been trying to ignore so aggressively. So they are not, they don't have peace, I, seriously, even mental peace, because I mean, I think it's the psychology of the criminal, you know, the psychology of the thief. They can't have peace because they have committed many crimes. And now Greece is speaking out uh, more and more about the genocide. And I think they should speak even more, you know, both the academia and the government and the public talking about the genocide and trying to obtain justice for it should be one of the main policies of Greece. And other governments, the US government has recognized the Armenian genocide. I mean, these things are happening and I think the government of Turkey is panicking and the more they panic, the more aggressive they get. So of course, like I said, if one day Turkey is going to be a democracy, it's going to happen if, if they recognize the genocide and if they apologize. And if they start respecting the genocide victims and if they stop blaming them for the genocide, there is so much they can do to help secure some justice for the victims. And only then will Turkey be a healthy democracy. All other things, okay, the EU is trying to do some things, you know, there was this, these negotiations for years. And then the US, you know, Turkey became a NATO member, but what, what did Turkey's NATO membership do. Like they became a NATO member in 1952. Three years later, they carried out a pogrom, a horrible pogrom against Greeks, Armenians, and Jews of Constantinople in Istanbul. So unfortunately, Turkey's interactions with the West, with the EU, with the US, with NATO, haven't helped civilize the Turkish state, unfortunately. So that means that the West should change its attitude and its policy towards Turkey. And for the West as well, it should be one of their main policies to recognize the genocide, but that's not enough. They recognize it and then nothing, no. They should really drag Turkey or push Turkey to recognize the genocide and stop using this hostile language against the victims, against Greece, 
and others. I mean, imagine for the past two years, Turkey and Azerbaijan have been launching an aggressive war against Armenia. And Armenia was established by the survivors of the genocide. Again, we need to think about the Holocaust and Germany's stance and Israel's existence today and all other genocide. Like this is not how a genocide perpetrator state is supposed to act. Th that, that is a huge problem. And if other analysts, journalists, academics, if they really want to understand why Turkey is not a democracy, why Turkey is behaving the way it's behaving, they need to go back to a hundred years ago and they need to study the genocide and they need to study how Turkey, because of the denial of the genocide goes hand in hand with Turkey's human rights violations. Those thing, two things are intertwined. It's not, oh, Turkey is denying a crime that happened a hundred years ago. No, it's not that simple. The denial shapes Turkey's all other policies. So if we can make this connection, we can understand why Turkey is such an aggressive state today. Thank you. Thank you, Jai. And I, I have another comment and question uh, for you that relates to the things that we uh, discussed, because there is a, a kind of myth in the public discussion about Turkey's um, bad record when it comes to democracy, the lack of democracy and very bad uh, human rights uh, record. Uh, and usually many commentators and analysts um, link this, connect this a uh, negative situation uh, to the government of Recep Tayyip Erdogan, as if Turkey before the Erdogan's uh, presidency uh, was a kind of a democratic, um, liberal, uh, open society and state. And this is something that I would like to uh, discuss with you, because there is what I call the problem of the Kemalist ideology which is the foundational ideology of the contemporary uh, Turkish Republic in 1923 that was supposedly pro-Western, put this word in uh, quotes, of course. And I want to uh, ask for your own uh, thoughts and comments about the role that Kemalist ideology has played and continues, still continues to play in Turkey in the denial uh, of uh, genocide that was committed against Ponti Greeks and other Greeks um, of Anatolia. And also, uh, I, all, I wanted to ask you about uh, the position of different political parties of contemporary Turkey on the issue of genocide and the denial of this crime. Because I can understand extremist right-wing political Turkish political parties denying the genocide, but it's really hard to believe that even the so-called leftist uh, or the majority of so-called leftist political parties that are Kemalists mainly uh, also deny uh, the crime of genocide against Greeks and other communities of Anatolia. So the problem of Kemalist ideology and how it should be addressed. And also I want you to comment on the position of different political parties uh, on the issue of denial. Mm. When, when, when it comes to the denial of the genocide, the Greek, Armenian, Assyrian genocide, unfortunately, there is no difference between the political opposition and the AKP. I mean, uh, and I completely agree, people, a lot of people, especially in the West, are acting as if Turkey was a democracy until Erdogan came to power. I mean, the truth can't be further, it, that, that can't be further from the truth, it, that, that, that wasn't the case. Turkey, before Erdogan was still a tyranny, a tyranny for the Kurds, a tyranny for free thinking people. And did we have freedom to talk about the Armenian genocide and how were the minorities treated? How were the Alevis treated, for example? No, the Alevi faith was banned. It's still, I mean, it's not officially recognized. The gem houses, they're not officially recognized. There have been so many massacres against Alevis all before Erdogan came to power. Kurds, their language was completely banned. So many Kurds were killed for speaking Kurdish, for example, in public or for being Kurdish or for being Kurdish activists demanding freedom. And, and the, all these things happened before Erdogan came to power. And how were Greeks treated? How were Armenians treated? Did, did they have a free life? When did the program against the Greeks and Armenians happen? It was in 1955. That was decades before Erdogan came to power. So. It's a very, I think, lazy and simplistic attempt to understand Turkey that, I mean, a closer study of Turkey's history, 
just demonstrates that Turkey has actually never been a democracy, okay? Because um, look at, especially when we look at the, how the ethnic and religious minorities have been treated. I mean, this is not how, and how um, dissenting or opposition media is treated. Even during the rule of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, for example, a lot of newspapers were closed during his rule and a lot of, there was a lot of pressure and persecution against dissenting journalists. So these things actually, you know, the, the founding of a country and the first government, the founding philosophy, the founding ideology is so important because if, it's, if a country is established on, a de, on you know, democratic principles, then how are you going to correct that? How are you going to fix that when there's a problem with the foundation of the country? And this is the case in Turkey, unfortunately. Actually, when Erdogan first came to power, he did some reforms, not because he was a Democrat. He was, he's always been an Islamist. He's always been a jihad sympathizer, but he did some reforms I think to maybe make the West happy, but he he you know he did some reforms reforms about the Kurdish language, for example, the public use of the Kurdish language that was a first in the history of Turkey. So no, Turkey has never been a democracy, and I was I don't want to say Turkey was worse before Erdogan came to power because I, I would never try to whitewash what Erdogan is doing today when there's so much persecution against millions of people in Turkey right now, not just Kurds, but also ethnic Turks. But seriously, it, it, it would be factually incorrect to claim that Turkey was ruled by better or more democratic governments before Erdogan. That would be completely untrue. And there's no difference between the political opposition and Erdogan when it comes to the denial of the genocide. They're both incredibly hostile and aggressive in their rhetorics. And what was the other question? I forgot. Uh, the other question, uh, uh, I wanted to, I wanted you to comment about uh, the position of different political parties regarding the issue of genocide and its denial. Huh. I well, said, we know the right-wing Turkish political parties, mm -hmm. we understand that they deny uh, the genocide, but what about the so-called left-wing political parties that are supposed to be open-minded, progressive, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? First of all, those uh, when we say leftist, even the CHP is kind of considered to be on the center left, but CHP, mm -hmm. main opposition party, their denial of the genocide is as horrible as the denial perpetrated by the AKP government. So, but the other like parties more on the left, they don't, they don't, they're not in the parliament, they don't have any political power. They are not as aggressive as the AKP, but again, it's not in their agenda or it's not, you know, it's not one of their priorities to talk about the genocide. But other, for example, uh, there's this new party uh, established by a former member of parliament who, who left the CHP. And of course, like all of these Kemalist parties that claim to be on the left are denialist, genocide denialist. And I am sure that if they come to power, their policies regarding the genocide or genocide denial would be the same as the policies of the AKP government. I don't think there would be any difference. No. Yeah, yeah. My, my understanding is that the only uh, political party that is currently uh, in the parliament uh, and it does not have a denialist position, on the contrary, it uh, talks about publicly, speaks about the recognition of genocides, uh, generally speaking, is the HDP, uh, the leader of uh, which is currently in prison, Selahattin Demirtas, as well as other uh, parliamentarians and activists from that, uh, from that party, unfortunately. Exactly. The Kurdish movement and the HDP, the People's uh, Democratic Party, um, they are the only legal party in Turkey right now that doesn't deny the genocide, that actually recognizes the genocide or commemorates it every year. Yes, they are the, the, only, the, only, the voice. only normal party, the only voice that justly, I mean, that talks about the genocide in a truthful and just way. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we are uh, running out of time. Uh, I want to ask 
one more uh, question and comment uh, from you, uh, Uzai, if you allow me. Um, we've been talking about what successive Turkish governments and state authorities in Turkey have been doing, but I want us to think a bit and discuss about the society in Turkey, the different groups, especially the younger generations. Uh, what do they know uh, about the crime of genocide? Is there any hope to help these younger generation educate themselves uh, when it comes to the issue of the genocide against the Greeks and other communities in Anatolia? Uh, how important would that be? And what kinds of uh, projects should uh, partners from the Western world develop in order to help this younger generation better educate itself when it comes to the issue of, of genocide and human rights and democracy, of course? I think that there's definitely hope. There's always hope. And there's hope for the younger generations in Turkey as well. Because it's my observation that there are a lot of young people in Turkey who are frustrated with their government and who are looking for something else, who are looking for the facts or truth about history, about what happened in Turkey. And actually I was one of them, you know, when I was in Turkey, when I was a child in Turkey, when I was younger, mm. I went to the same schools. I was indoctrinated with the same things. But then to be honest, being, you know, joining social media, of course, I went to university and, you know, I was introduced to all these new ideas and new knowledge, but even social media, helped a lot when I, when I was younger, when I was, you know, at high school and university, I became friends with, for example, Greek Cypriots. And I started reading their articles and I said, oh my God, there's, there's a lot about something completely different. So when we, like I said, when we tell the truth about Turkey's history, this is not anti-Turkish, this is pro-truth. And we want to help open the minds of Turkish people as well, because they're actually victims of their own ideology they are you know if they are victims right now of human rights abuses at the hands of their government it's their own making and how will they change that they can only change it by learning the truth and by establishing more democratic parties and by demanding change through you know change from the political establishment there so and i also would like to say something that i think is related to your question there are these friendship, Turkish-Greek friendship initiatives between Greece and Turkey. Mm -hmm. And of course, we want, we want to be friends, we need to be friends. But I think true friendship can only be based on truth, truth, reality, facts, and justice. If Turkey is bullying you into silence, and if Turkey or if Turks are telling you, uh -uh, if you talk about this, if you say genocide, if you use the, the G word, we can't be friends, don't provoke us, this is not friendship, this is bullying. This is aggression. This is those are threats. If if you want to have good neighborly relations, if you want to be friends, both on governmental level and on individual levels, it should be based on truth. And we need to have the freedom to have informed public debates about all issues, but particularly the genocide. This is this is good for Greece because. We need to obtain justice for the victims. This is, this is a humanitarian issue. It's the human rights issue. But it's also for the democratization of Turkey because you can't build a democracy based on lies and based on propaganda and based on crimes against humanity. So telling the truth will definitely help a lot of open-minded Turks in Turkey. And first they might react in an aggressive way because you know unbrainwashing doesn't happen overnight, it takes time. But when we tell the truth, at least when we have these conversations and when we ask questions and when we seek answers, that it's not hostile to Turks. It's just, we do it because we are seeking the truth and we want justice and we want stability in the region. And I 100% I believe, I totally believe that Appeasing Turkey and just, you know, ignoring these conversations, avoiding these conversations just to save the day will make the Turkish government even more aggressive because they see weakness in you then, you know, you have to show that you have strength. You're not scared of telling the truth. And I think it's important. And it's the only way of forming true friendship between nations. And I think this is a great way to end our discussion, Uzai. 
I want to thank you very, very much for this fascinating presentation um, and the discussion we uh, we had. Thank you very much. And I also went, I want to thank um, everyone who uh, was with us uh, through the internet watching these, uh, these discussions and presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it a lot. I would like to meet you on other debates as well. Thank you. Thanks.